This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. 8. Meeting with the Guru How great, therefore, was my joy to find before my very eyes the living embodiment of those far-off ideals, a man who impressed all those who came in touch with him, not merely by his learning, but by his mere presence, and thus gave proof that what the sacred texts teach can be realized here and now, as in the days of the Buddha. What greater opportunity could fate offer me than meeting such a man and coming into living contact with the spirit that had moved the Buddhas and saints of the past and would inspire those of the future? Soon my first meeting with the Guru came about. It took place in one of the little shrine rooms on the upper floor of the Labrang, the main residential building of the monastery, which served as his private apartments whenever he stayed at Yiga Chöling, and which, even during his absence, were regarded as the monastery's innermost sanctuary. Like in the temple, the great abbot's seat is a place of special sanctity, as it is here that he performs his daily devotions and spends many hours in meditation even during the night, which he spends in a cross-legged position in the confined space of his seat, which allows him neither to lie down nor to stretch out. The high back of this box-like, slightly raised meditation seat bore the emblem of the Lama's high office, the Wheel of the Law, and was surmounted by the traditional canopy with a seven-colored volant representing the aura of the Buddha. The whole room breathed an atmosphere of peace and beauty, the natural outflow of a mind to whom harmony is not merely an aesthetic pleasure, but the adequate expression of a life devoted to the realm of the spirit. Exquisite religious paintings minutely executed and mounted on old Chinese brocades, harmonized with the mellow colors of hand-woven Tibetan rugs, which covered the low seats behind lacquer-topped, delicately carved and painted chogtses. On the opposite side, golden images of the finest workmanship rested in glazed shrines, flanked by dragons and crowned by multicolored carved cornices, and on the narrow ledge before the images stood silver bowls, filled with clear water and butter lamps of chased silver. There was not a single object in the room that was not connected with the symbols and functions of religious life and practice, and nothing that could have been regarded as the Guru's personal possession. But all these details fused into one general impression of supreme peace and harmony on that first day, when I bowed down before the Guru and his hands lay on my head. Hands whose lightest touch sent a stream of bliss through one's whole body, nay, one's whole being, so that all that one had intended to say or to ask vanished from one's mind like smoke into blue air. Merely to be in this man's presence seemed to be enough to dissolve all problems, to make them non-existent, like darkness in the presence of light. As he sat on his meditation seat under the canopy, clad in the simple maroon-colored robes of a Tibetan monk, I found it difficult to determine his age, though he must have been already about sixty-five years old at that time. His short-cropped hair was still dark, and his body looked sturdy and erect. His clean-shaven face showed the features of a strong character, but his friendly eyes and his mouth that were slightly turned up at the corners as if ready to smile gave me an immediate feeling of reassurance. It is a strange fact that nobody ever succeeded in taking a photograph of Tomo Geshe Rinpoche, though many people tried to do so surreptitiously, because they knew that he never allowed anybody to take a picture of him.